the live stream. I'm here today with John Brissom. Hey everybody, how you doing today? Uh, today we're going to do part two of the upper gut uh, stream and uh, the last time we talked about some of the technical things uh, with the upper gut and dysbiosis and so forth and today we're going to talk more about the theory uh, about upper gut and sort of uh, where people are likely to get H. pylori infections, uh, how they become opportunistic, stuff that's maybe not as clinical, uh, maybe not quite as proven, but still uh, interesting nonetheless. And uh, so, uh, first of all, um, if, you, if you haven't watched the last live stream, uh, you should probably watch that one first just to get the technical information, and then you can come back to this one and uh, and it, some of it should make more sense. So uh, let's let's start first, John, with um, I guess the the theory of where H. pylori infections are coming from. So where are people likely to be exposed to H. pylori? Um. Well, uh, through many different routes um, that we know of, um, has been indicate indicated of. Uh, being found in uh, public drinking water sources, like municipal water sources, uh, being shared um, uh, through that route, you know, drinking unfiltered water uh, from the tap, um, because uh, it is strong enough to survive uh, most, most chloramine con concoctions that are used to disinfect water uh, by uh, producing strong biofilms. Um, so it might be a possibility that a lot of people are becoming infected through water sources that previously, previously before the use of chloramines when straight free chlorine was used, um, to disinfect water, which appears to be somewhat stronger, um, uh, less in cases of H. pylori were occurring uh, compared to the past, I'd say 15 years. Um, another source would be, um, just falling in love with somebody and kissing them. <laughs> uh, H, uh, one of the reservoirs of H. pylori is in the mouth, um, and it's one of the common ways that it's spread um, is through um, kissing. Um, so that ha appears to be happening, uh, being one of the ways it's spread now. A lot of people are unaware that they have uh, overgrowth. Um, and I guess another way from what I've heard too, is contaminated fruits and vegetables uh, that were grown in human manure. Um, you know, vegetables and fruits that are coming from some third world countries um, might, you know, where they are allowed to use human manure um, as a source of fertilizer compared to the United States where that is illegal. Um, unless you grow your own food, you're able to, but as far as commercially grown crops, uh, human manure is not allowed to my knowledge. Um, but that is also a potential source of developing uh, H. pylori, is eating contaminated fruits and vegetables. Um, and I think those are the main sources to my knowledge. Jason, have you heard of any other? I, I mean, I've heard of it possibly being transferred on uh, endoscopes where people get endoscopies and stuff like that. I've heard that as a possible transfer, which a lot of people aren't aware of that a lot of infectious diseases can be transferred for endoscopes because it cannot be properly autoclaved. There have been uh, rare instances of uh, HIV being transmitted through endoscopes as well as severe staph infections being transmitted through endoscopes. So it would be easy to say that H. pylori being biopsied quite frequently and should be able to somewhat uh, possibly survive an autoclaving um, if it's able to get in certain crevices of devices that the autoclave is not able to clean uh, it would also be a reservoir of trans, uh, you know, transmitting or giving the, the bacteria. There's also an argument that um, H. pylori could also be what's considered to be natural flora, um, which would mean that we... About 50 to 70 percent of the people, yeah. Yeah, 50 to 70 percent of the people ha have it and don't have an issue with it. Uh, but let's just go back to the first thing that you said about uh, it being in our water source. So uh, what John was talking about is that there's a theory that the H, H. pylori is, is in common tap water. And since um, municipalities have switched over to using 
chloramine, this, the, the chemical chloramine to sterilize the water rather than chlorine, uh, that it's not killing off the H. pylori and they're able to survive in biofilm. And uh, they're seeing they're seeing buildup of these biofilms in, in plumbing and in, uh, in, in these uh, junctions that are leading into homes. And so uh, there, there is some evidence for that. And so they have to do a, a regular chlorine flush every once like in a while. Twice a year, my local municipality, Fevel PwC, does a free chlorine flush two months out of the year where they use just straight heavy amounts of chlorine and the water smells like straight bleach. Mm. Uh, but yeah, that's what I've heard is they're doing that to flush the biofilms out. And Erin Brockovich has done a lot of work into investigating this and so forth and so on, and she definitely agrees that that's what is occurring. Yeah, it's interesting. Um, and so, yeah, I think that that the research and you know, there's a lot of evidence on the horizon saying that people are getting infected from the water sources, and constant exposure to drinking tap water. Uh, could that be a possibility for overgrowth? Could that be a possibility um, for uh, for it becoming opportunistic? Just a constant exposure to new. Um, H. pylori. Um, just depends on the strains. Yeah. Strains that you're getting, you know, if it, you know, that you're coming in contact with. You know, there are un less opportunistic strains of H. pylori, like Sega Plus, that seem to be beneficial for humans. And, you know, there's different strains of H. pylori that would be more opportunistic than Sega Plus would be. Yeah. So, um, have, have they gone as far as doing a catalog of which strains they're finding in tap water and what gen genetics they have? Not yet, to my knowledge. No, it hasn't gone that far yet. I think that'd be an important step, too. Uh, I agree. Because there's a lot of bacteria that are just ubiquitous. You know, they're everywhere. And is H. pylori one of them? And, um, you know, because they're also found in a lot of places, they're pretty hardy. <laughs> And survive. I mean, true, if, but you are right about that. But in first world countries, for example, like the United States, uh, there's a decrease of H. pylori uh, colonization, even though it's on the rise now, uh, for years because of over sanitization and so forth and so on, compared to third world countries where the rates of native flora colonization arrival between 70 to 90 percent, where in first world countries it's between 50 to 70 percent. Yeah, well, in, in some countries, you know, you should boil the water before you drink it. Um, and that's just kind of what they do. They make teas and coffees and stuff and uh, hot chocolate. And they, you know, they just boil it up and drink it that way because they don't have, they don't put the additives in their drinking water. And in some ways, that's probably healthier, wouldn't you, wouldn't you say? I mean, to a degree, but they're also not, of course, the water itself not adding fluoride or chloramines to it, of course, would be beneficial, but at the same cost that they're also not fil filtrating the water as well. Um, you know, now granted, most filtered, quote unquote, filtered water that you get from a municipality isn't that great, greatly filtered to begin with, um, you know, but it's still better than what you would get in a third world country, minus the fluoride and you know, the chloramine aspect of it, as far as the sanitation aspect of it, it's more sanitary to drink. Uh, will it be like that in the future if we can continue to use chloramines? I don't know. Uh, Eric Brockovich says it won't, uh, that our water will go back to being almost undrinkable if we continue to use it, it's a disinfection method. Um, and I think Klein to agree, just the data I've seen on H. pylori alone, um, imagine what other bacteria that also produce biofilms and able to cause, you know, problems with them as well and the contaminated water supplies. It's scary. Um, you know, actually, um, um, Aaron Brockovich is saying the increase in Legionella might be used from the use of chloramines too as well. Um, they call, of course, known as the cause of Legionnaire's disease. Um, some scary stuff, Jason. Yeah. Legionnaire's though, uh, if you drink it, and uh, that's it's a common infection in the lungs, so you drink it and then aspirate it into the lungs, and then you get infected that way, right? Most people breathe it in through air conditioners. 
Uh, it's mo mostly co only found in hospitals and stuff like that now. Legionella is through industrial air conditioners that don't heat up uh, the temperature properly, so the bacteria grows in the water that's already present in. Um, you know, so it, that would, you know, that's the most common exposure, just like, you know, the reason why I call it Legionnaires is it's found a Legion, in a Legion Hall air conditioner, uh, I believe in the 1970s, somewhere in New York. Um, but yeah, yeah, I don't know if ingesting, if it would work the same way ingesting Legionella or not. Uh, but I know definitely inhaling it would cause Legionnaires disease. Yeah. Um. Yeah, if, I mean, if you, yeah, you inhale it. I guess in the shower, if it's steaming, there's a possibility you could get it that way, or if you drank it and then uh, some of it aspirated into the lungs, like you, uh, I don't know, something went down the wrong pipe, or for some reason coughed and it, and it got into your lungs, that would be a possibility too. Um, yeah, I mean, looking it up real quick, um, it was actually Philadelphia where the Legion Hall was, not in uh, New York, but um, it did happen in the 70s, which you are correct, it is known to cause gastrointestinal illnesses, um, but, you know, it just depends on where you get it, just like Club Ciela, you know, if you get it in the lungs, you know, it's causing pneumonia, if you get it in the joints, it's the cause of rheumatoid arthritis, so it would appear that Legionella can affect different parts of the body too as well. Yeah, that's that's interesting. So, um, I guess uh, if if you're eating food that was produced and um, it was uh, produced using human feces as fertilizer, which a lot of produce that we get that comes in the United States for our consumption does, particularly fruit, um, that could be another source for contamination. Yes. Yes, because uh, human beings would excrete uh, H. pylori through the stool. Are there any other animals that are known to carry H. pylori other than human beings? That to my knowledge, not not well. Um, H. pylori is strictly somewhat has evolved for us to be its main carrier. Okay. Um, that that'd be interesting though, because uh, you know, like. Uh, I get most most commercial places though just use like um, uh, just like you know if it, if they wanted a nitrogen fertilizer they just use straight up nitrogen or whatever um, and you know it's expensive to use uh, animal manure as, as fertilizer but uh, for organic produce that might be a possibility and since it's organic and it doesn't have the pesticides and stuff then you know it could be washed. Um, I mean, you know, it could, it could, uh, it doesn't have to, it, like some people say, well, you don't have to wash it as much because you don't have the chemicals on it. I would still wash it if it comes out of a third world country is not grown in the United States, for example. I definitely would wash it even if it was organic, uh, just because of the risk of bacteria that are biofilms that are found on produce. And, you know, and, and heliobacter uh, have been found in animals. Um, as reservoirs too, but you know, like cats and dogs. But is it is it that we gave it to our pets? Um, you know, that would be a possibility for that too as well. It's also been found in rats too. Um, but it seems H. pylori's most dominant figure is is just like uh, toxic plasmosis gondii tried to make humans its dominant figure, but still mainly in cats and rats. Um, you know, it seems that H. pylori, human being, is its preferred host. That's interesting. Um, yeah, I guess like uh, multi-stomached organisms uh, probably have a different environment. Um, you know, like birds, like chickens and stuff, they have to eat, well, I guess they don't have to, but they typically eat uh, gravel and stones to help with their digestion. And then, uh, you know, like dogs and cats and stuff have a heavy protein based diet yeah i don't think dogs and cats are strong reservoirs for the bacteria itself i think if they get it it'd have to come from human beings would be my guess yeah they have such a short gi tract anyway um so i guess we're kind of like the goldilocks environment not yeah. too cold not too hot but uh they must be i mean 
unless I mean so if you look at this from an evolutionary standpoint um, which organism came first was it homo sapiens or h pylori you know did, did they survive as a you know did they are they able to survive because we're here on this planet or um, were they here first and then they just sort of colonized us I would assume that's probably what occurred based off of the data that I looked at yeah. Um, you, just like Blastis's hominis decided that we would be its preferred host. Um, yeah. I would assert the same thing would be with Heliobacter pylori. Um, I know that in one study I did read a long time ago about dogs and cats, like we were talking about the last live stream, I do believe initially when they were studying cats and dogs to try to determine whether or not they had each pylori overgrowth or not, they kept running into Campylobacter. Um, and then, you know, from there, they eventually distinguished that it was Campylobacter and not H. pylori. Hmm. Same thing, problem that they were having with humans. Yeah, interesting. I'm reading a study right now that says that uh, chimpanzees are, are often infected with um, one of four strains of H. pylori, which is interesting. So I guess uh, primates are more susceptible but it's unlikely that they're going to use like chimpanzee feces for, <laughs> for yeah i'm pretty sure it's human beings that are spreading it through fecal contamination yeah and that's interesting well um yeah and so then um i guess that it's transmitted from person to person uh, that's of course very likely too yes through kissing mainly because uh, it lives in the oral cavity. Sure. Um, what What about like uh, sharing a, a drink or something like that? Is it that contagious? I don't know if it really will survive in saliva for a long period of time outside of the body. Um, it might be able to, um, you know, it, it, but I would say that the risk of getting it is lower from drinking after somebody than it would be from um kissing someone but that being said i would assume that you know it, there is a chance especially if someone has significant overgrowth um in the mouth and has like burning mouth syndrome for example mm -hmm. um and, you know or you know could be a possibility that if you drank after that person you could end up with h pylori yourself it depends on a lot of factors you know it depends if your body's able to fight it off it's not able to fight it off you know, you know whether or not you become infected. We 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 come in contact with, you know, thousands upon thousands of viruses and bacteria and yeast every day on a daily basis, parasites. Um, you know, and not all of them become you know hosts or use us as a host within our body. Um, you know, so I'm pretty sure that with H. pylori, I would assume that that's the, I'm pretty sure. A lot of us come in contact with it, but the reason why they they give they throw around that you know fifty to ninety percent number is because not for everybody has it colonized, or not for everyone can even show up on a test positively, even though it might still be there. For all we know, it could the numbers could be close to ninety nine percent that everybody walking around with H. pylori, or the numbers could be much lower. It just depend on that. Our testing methods to determine uh, infections and overgrowths and stuff like that or colonizations even themselves are kind of weak at best jason you, you know that yeah so like uh h pylori are known to cause stomach ulcers correct and what about the uh the ulcers are your in your oral cavity you know the the canker sores that people get is it the same thing they are able to cause adolphus ulcers too as well um but adolphus ulcers are generally caused by Usually, usually like abrasions in the mouth and stuff like that from you know, accidentally chewing on your lip or your gum, should I say mm. on your lip. Um, yeah. But yes, it is a possibility that H. pylori has been linked to adulterous ulcers or canker sores. Um, there are some studies about it also causing dental caries if you have overgrowth in the mouth. You know, burning mouth syndrome, um, possible geographic tongue, um, and even uh, surgeon syndrome. With saliva glands as well as tears as far as the infection areas within the, the mouth 
seems to be what it's able to do. Yeah, it's interesting. I've also read that um, severe dental plaque is actually H. pylori biofilm. Yeah. Like 78% of periodontic uh, suffer, or like uh, people who, um, I don't, dentist, dentistry is not my strong suit, but it's like uh, people who have like chronic, chronic periodontal disease. Yeah, yeah. Um, like 78% of those people, uh, the, the cause of that is H. pylori. So I guess don't kiss somebody who's <laughs> got yep. that. H. pylori and streptococcus mutans. Um, and actually, Klebsiella pneumonia has been indicated in uh, dental carriers as well. They seem to be the big three that causes uh, a lot of the uh, dental caries. Uh, Cavities, should I say, dental caries is the correct term for them. Cavities people get in their teeth. And the biofilm that if you haven't brushed your teeth in a while and you take your finger and you scrape your teeth, that little film that comes out, you know, uh, Streptococcus mutans is able to produce it, H. pylori is able to produce it, and Clumsiella pneumonia is able to produce it. Yeah. Yeah, that's pretty wild. So, um, yeah, that, that's interesting. So those basically are the three areas how um, H. pylori developed. The next topic I kind of wanted to go into is uh, known as the H. pylori paradox, where it would appear that H. pylori is the organism that causes um, all the gastric pressure that leads to um, acid reflux disorder, but they're finding out that um, like there's an inverse relationship clinically. So like it, the people who have um, more acid reflux tend to have that they don't, they can't find the H. pylori and people who have, um, you know, uh, more H. pylori don't seem to have indications of acid reflux, which is, you know, for, for a long time, it said that has to be the organism causing acid reflux because it survives so well in that kind of environment. And uh, so what's your take on that? Um, they discovered that it depends on what part of the body that the H or the stomach shows the body, what part of the stomach or the, the duodenum um, did the H. pylori colonize or infect? And it depends if it's in the mucosal barrier or if it's actually out within the stomach tissue, you know, mucosa itself or within the stomach, you know, proliferating, causing issues. Um, so we see like, for example, if it in, and if it infects or colonizes the body, which is like the middle part of the stomach, okay? So if H. pylori colonizes the body, it tends to reduce GERD symptoms. People don't get GERD, even though they have H. pylori infection, but they can get ulcers, okay? Or gastritis or even stomach cancer if it eventually reaches that point. So people in the body, they don't have GERD, but they'll have gastritis or stomach pain or you know, ulcers and stuff like that, because the H. pylori shuts off the proton pump if it, if it colonizes the body of the stomach, it shuts it down. So that way it can perforate, because H. pylori, it doesn't like very, very low pH levels. So if it can shut off the stomach acid or at least reduce it, it can thrive. So if it if it colonizes the body or the middle part of the stomach, you see people with actually having less amounts of GERD and more um, ulcers or gastritis and stuff like that. Now, if it colonizes the, the pleuris, which is the bottom part of the stomach or the pleuric sphincter as it connects to the wadna, there, on the other hand, you see an increase of gastric production, like an increase uh, of stomach acid production, the gastric signaling and stuff, like increase in pepsin. And in doing so, you also see increase in pressure, um, which will push the acid acidic contents upwards, mix, sometimes mixed with bile, depending on how weak the pleuric sphincter is. And in those people, they see GERD. Okay, so it depends on what part of the stomach the H. pylori colonizes. If it colonizes the body, you'll have less GERD, but you'll have more gastritis. If it colonizes the pleuric area, the pleuric sphincter, 
you see, or even duodenum, you see more like duodenal ulcers, preploric ulcers, but you see more GERD. Now, if it which is the paradoxical thing that you're talking about, if it colonizes the cardia, which is the top part of the stomach, okay, that's where the, near where the LES is. You would think in theory, if it messed with the LES, if it weakened it, you should see GERD, okay, but you don't. Just like the body, if it in, if it infects the cardia or colonizes the cardia, you don't see GERD. Okay, so my belief is that in those people, most of the time you'll see a cardia colonization, which is the top part of the stomach, and you'll see a, a pleuric colonization too in those people, which is the bottom part, connects to the water. So I'm guessing that dual colonization um, causes inflammation, like gastritis and stuff like that, more than actually modulating the hormones uh, you know, re probably reduces gas, gas or probably reduces the proton pump. And in doing so, because of all that excess inflammation, hormonal changes and stuff like that, instead it causes just inflammation instead of GERD or reflux. Um, but that would seem to be the case. Now, we'll say this. If it is a probiotic strain of H. pylori and it has colonized mostly the entire stomach, most people have no problems whatsoever. They don't have gastritis. They don't have GERD. It's completely asymptomatic, and they have no problems. Um, we don't know why that is. I'm guessing that's because if you do get a good strain like Sega Plus, and it's able to colonize the whole entire stomach and is able to be kept in the mucosal barrier because the stomach's able to produce enough stomach acid, enough pepsin, it's what's able to, and your lactobacillus is still there and your lactobacillus is able to keep it in check because lactobacillus is also found in the stomach because a lot of people believe that the stomach is a sterile environment, which it is not. There are bacteria that survive in the stomach. If H. pylori is kept in check throughout the whole entire stomach where it's able to colonize equal colonization, it seems to be beneficial. Yeah, that's interesting. I, the other, I guess, discrepancies that I've seen in the studies are, um, have been that they haven't used biopsies, that they've used uh, other tests like uh, IG, IgG, IgA markers. Right. And so they're not showing up on the, on the uh, IgG, IgA panel. So one of the theories that I had was that maybe people have, like their immune system just not fighting it, and that's why it's, uh, able to become opportunistic because they're, the human immune system's not fighting it. Uh, what do you think about that as a possibility? That's definitely a possibility. Um, but generally, that's how it becomes opportunistic, not necessarily it, where it's dependent on causing GERD or not. Uh, but you are correct that a lot of the studies um, show based off of, you know, immune, uh, you know, antigen reaction and stuff like that compared to or antibody reaction compared to um, actual biopsies you know where most of the studies that were done to determine whether or not if parts of the stomach correlate with GERD or correlate with symptoms of H. pylori like at the cardia or the body or the pleuric sphincter most of those were done by actual biopsies that tested positive for H. pylori to be only in that area um, you know so it's hard to say whether or not I would say there are a lot more people who have opportunistic at H. pylori overgrowth than who test positive for them because H. pylori has so many mechanisms to trick, you know, the, the testing methods we have as far as antibody testing um, and, and even, and even uh, um, biopsy testing. If they don't biopsy the exact area where the H. pylori is and it's a transit bacteria, it can go anywhere between the mouth, the esophagus, the, you know, the, the different parts of the stomach, the duodenum, the vagus nerve, or even possibly even the brain, you know. So, you know, you might biopsy a part of the stomach that it's not in, like the body, for example, and it could still instead be in the duodenum, you know, and then say, oh, you test you test negative for H. pylori, but that's not the case. It's there. It's just it's another part. Or it could be embedded so deep in the mucosa that a standard biopsy will not uh, get it either. Um, you know, so it, there's a lot of problems that we have with current testing for the bacteria itself. And it's best more to go on symptoms for most people um, than it is testing for the bacteria. So I guess, um, you know, when, I mean, some of, 
Okay, so sorry, let me regroup here. Um, what environmental factors would cause H. pylori to be in one part of the stomach versus another or um, hide in the, you know, to dig deeper in the mucosal barrier or, you know, to go up to the brain? Like, what, what has to be present? Why don't they just uh, colonize everything simultaneously, just kind of like every place they can be, they are, you know, what, what would cause them to go into hiding or are they hiding or what, what's, what's really going on there? The body's immune system. That's the only way. I mean, unless your body completely shuts down as far as the immune system is concerned, it wouldn't colonize everywhere. And if it did, you would die from septicemia. Um, you know, so the immune system is active in certain parts of the body. The body has multiple barriers to try to keep it from being able to get into different parts of the body and so forth and so on. So, like, for example, we'll take the stomach, okay? The stomach contains lactobacillus as a probiotic. Um, that produces bactericides that try to reduce H. pylori overgrowth, as well as, you know, lactic acid, um, and it tries to reduce the pH of the stomach to the best of its ability, uh, combined with gastric acid. Um, you know, so there is that, and then, of course, there is gastric acid itself, um, which lactobus, I mean, um, H. pylori, bacteria pylori does not like uh, low pH, you know, acidic environments. Um, you know, so the stomach has that, and of course, then we have our own innate immune system of, you know, uh, of macrophages and stuff like that, which try to reduce H. pylori if it comes in contact with it and stuff like that. And that's why, you know, not everybody who comes in contact with the bacteria itself uh, become infected. It's people who have problems where they've been taking proton pump inhibitors for two years, um, you know, and they have low stomach acid and lactobacillus amounts in their. Uh, their stomach are low because their diet isn't that great and they've been on PPIs, you know, and then they come in contact with H. pylori by even drinking a glass of contaminated water or kissing someone out on a date, um, you know, and then it's able to move from the mouth down to the stomach where it doesn't have those natural barriers that our body has put in place to try to stay, keep away the opportunistic strains of bacteria and, you know, pathogens that we come in contact with, um, you know, so to me, that's what makes a difference is it's where it's all it's where your weak parts are it's, you know it's where your weaknesses are let's say for your mouth for example uh you came in contact with h pylori and you don't have the best oral care in the world and sure enough it's able to become the dominant you know strain within the, the mouth or is able to work together with club cielo or streptococcus mutans and lo and behold then you have burning mouth syndrome but your stomach's pretty good because you don't take ppis and uh, your diet's not that bad you know so that's why it doesn't move down to your stomach and relatively stays in your mouth um those are all just guesses jason to be honest with you we don't 100% know why that doesn't occur or, you know, the natural progression of the bacteria seems to be the mouth, the esophagus, the stomach, that down to either to the duodenum or to the vagus nerve and then to the brain. Um, you know, that seems to be the progression of the bacteria itself. Um, why that doesn't happen to everybody, why it stays strictly in the mouth for some people, why it stays strictly in the stomach, you know, why it stays strictly in the, in the do I know why it doesn't get to the, affecting the vagus nerve or why it doesn't get to the brain fully? I don't know. I guess it has to do with a lot of factors of immune function and the body's natural defenses to keep it, that from occurring uh, would be my guess. So the, I mean, the immune system would be coming from uh, the circulatory system, right? I mean, the uh, why the white blood cells are going to be the ones that are attacking the pathogenic agents, right? Correct. And we so, also have tissues themselves within our body that's able to secrete certain parts of the immune system, too, that are able to help. Yeah, you know, like if you have a skin infection, the body can fight that, you know. Uh, you know so the, the, the mucosa itself has its own immune tissue. Right, yeah, like it'll, right, it'll, like the the capillaries will swell and then it'll increase the blood flow and it'll get some of that at the same time. So, uh, but then the, the deeper it digs down into the uh, mucosal barrier, wouldn't they be more susceptible to an attack from the human immune system? It has different ways of shutting the immune system and different ways of, of shutting it down. It triggers Th1 dominance 
through mass inflammation. Um, it has different ways of tricking the immune system to get it to leave it alone. That's interesting, yeah. Um, so the next area I want to talk about is... Reduction of nitrous oxide and stuff like that. I just want to throw that in there. It's got different ways of increasing ammonia. It's got different ways of shutting down the immune system. It's a very tricky organism. Yeah. He, I mean, you say it almost as if it has intelligence, you know, like it's tricking us, it's tricking doctors. It's not tricking. It's just it's very good at adapting, and it's very good at learning. <laughs> like, I know it's just for its own survival ne mechanisms and for proliferation, but at the same time, you got to give it credit. I mean, I, I, know I it have to. Silly. I don't think it has intelligence like human beings or the Borg, but <laughs> it's you got you got to clap it. It's very smart. I mean, you know, I mean, I'm you know, I'm not used. I understand what you're saying. I can't shouldn't give it intelligence like it knows, you know. But you got to give it some credit at least, Jason. It's able to trick our immune system in a lot of different ways. So what you're saying is, if I had H. pylori infecting my brain, I would score higher on the MCAT. No, I'm pretty sure you would suffer from rage disorder. No, because you said they're smart, and I'd have them <laughs> in my brain. I don't think it, or it, or multiple sclerosis if it gets to the brain. I don't. I don't. I don't think he's going to make you smarter. I think you're going to have a lot of problems. All um, right. You know, so it, pretty much what John's saying is that it'll turn you into a superhero. <laughs> uh, we're going to move on to the next topic. The Hulk. The Hulk. Turn you into the Hulk. Yes. Well, that's gamma radiation. Stage John, don't, be, so. don't be. Don't be silly now. Time <laughs> out. H. Pylori. Come hey. on. Hey. Hey. It's able to. It's able to control neurotransmitters outside of our digestive system. Is able to control a lot of things, especially if it makes us to the vagus nerve. It's. I mean, just in the stomach itself, it's able to reduce nitric oxide production, and you know a lot of digestive hormones. But even when you get out of the digestive system, it's able to control a lot of vagus function by upregulating, causing the sympathetic nervous system to stay on, and downregulating the parasympathetic nervous system. It's just. It's brilliant. I hate to say it, but it's it yeah, really but evolved to take us over to a degree. It doesn't. Uh, it doesn't control neuro, neuro, neurotransmitters. Are just chemical agents, so it can secrete neurotransmitters. It can cause us to secrete. Correct. That's what I mean. Yes. It can cause, It can trigger us to secrete, and it can secrete some itself. Yes. Or I guess fire neurons, or however you want to describe that process. But yeah, I mean. Um, it's yeah, it's it's an interesting organism. So the next thing I wanted to talk about was, uh, and uh, if we could just move on to this next topic of um, diet and its effect on H. pylori. What foodstuffs do, do H. pylori uh, thrive on, and and is there a way that we can con control H. pylori through diet? I don't know. There's not enough studies on it. I don't know. There's not enough studies with upper gut bacteria. I can sit here and theorize all day long that H. pylori would prefer glucose. Um, it would not like resistant starch very much because it wouldn't have enough time to break it down or have the capability of using enzymes to break it down properly. Um, so it would like prefer jasmine rice over basmati rice. Um, you know, I mean glutamine protein fermentation i mean all these sulfurous foods if it's a hydrogen sulfide producing strain um you know i mean all of these would help it out um you know i just there's not that's the only reason why i haven't written much about upper gut overgrowths um and diet because unlike the fodmap diet which we know is that that can't help when used properly and you know there's certain tweaks that you can do to it to help improve the diet so it doesn't reduce uh, probiotic growth. Um, you know, can't help people who have small intestine or large intestine overgrowth. But as far as upper gut overgrowth like H. pylori or Citrobacter or Proctus mirabilis, um, there's not much information on diet for it. And I, if, if in theory it should be any anything that feeds SIBO, should more than likely not feed H. pylori to a degree, um, except for cruciferous vegetables or anything that's high in thiols, which would feed certain strains of hydrogen sulfide producing H. pylori or Proteus mirabilis or Citrobacter 
or glucose or glutamine or protein um, had do you have you heard anything jason i mean am i covering it i mean all that's theoretical there's been no studies to my knowledge that anybody has had to try to formulate stuff like that it's only based off of the metabolic processes and pathways h pluri uses i knew somebody who i believed had an h pluri overgrowth and who had a geographic tongue who bloated from malate and then come to discover that h pluri is able to use malate as a form of energy to increase right. replication rep replication and proliferation so I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, I mean they're um, they're in the upper gut, so it's, uh, it's you know respiration is possible. I've read studies that have to do with air swallowing um, that show that um, one of I guess one of the evolutionary benefits that H. pylori have to uh, upregulating the parasympathetic nervous system is that it increases air swallowing and they tend to do better when you know, swallow air in the stomach and they have more oxygen and uh, helps them uh, go through respiration so with the malic acid you know they can proliferate a lot more um, there are often people who write in saying that they can't tolerate uh, certain amino acids like glutamine glutamate um, and that that type of thing and there have been some in vitro studies about h pylori using glutamate and, and glutamine uh, which are you know single amino acids usually when you eat a piece of chicken or you know you eat some kind of protein um, you're getting uh, you're getting a whole series of amino acids all chained together through the amine backbone you know you have different amino side chains and that's what distinguishes one amino acid for the from the other and, but when you take a single amino acid, you know, like if you're doing an L-glutamine protocol or you're using glutamate as a flavoring in your food or something, some people say that they have a sensitivity to it and they claim that they have uh, like some kind of, uh, they claim that it's turning into MSG monosodium glutamate in their bodies and all this other stuff. And there's like, there's entire diets that are written around um, this fallacy and I tried to uh, debunk it on the blog uh, with my article, but nonetheless, there are still some people who have reactions to these amino acids, and I think that uh, H. pylori, given what H. pylori can do with, with those amino acids, they are probably experiencing side effects from H. pylori. They're probably getting um, a toxic payload from uh, from the secretion of their, their toxic pot byproducts that's leaching out into their uh, bloodstream and since you know they do create ulcers they do burrow and they do bad things it's it's very easy to to get the uh, endotoxin into the bloodstream you know the leaky gut uh, happens in, in a much higher degree or in your gums you know if, if you have the, the periodontal disorder um, you know there's a reason why people have uh, cardiovascular complications due to gum disease is because that endotoxins it's crossing over into the bloodstream and it's it's you know it's uh, depositing onto cholesterols and lashing onto the heart you know uh, and so that's that's not a good thing um, so that that's one of the I guess that's that's one of the um, one of the theories that I have uh, on amino acids. And, and I agree with you. I definitely believe that it does react to glutamine. Um, and it's also that it can ferment, ferment full protein as well, because I had a client who had a citrobacter overgrowth, uh, which is also another upper gut overgrowth. And every time she ate more than 20 to 25 uh, grams of protein per meal, she would bloat. Yeah. So, we, you know, pro protein fermentation is not talked a lot about. Um, in studies and stuff like that, or, 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 you know, we always talk about carbohydrate fermentation, but these bacteria are able to ferment protein. Well, fermentation is uh, simply the conversion of uh, the conversion of energy in the absence of oxygen. Um, and so with oxygen, which is definitely possible in the stomach um, and, 
you know, a, a gibbon in the in the in the mouth in the oral cavity. In the in this and you know, but um, with the you know the fer fer fermentation can still occur in the stomach, not as likely to to occur as it does later on. Certain proteins are more susceptible to fermentation than others. Um, you know, like certain forms of seafood will throw some people off, and and certain it, it basically like there's certain collagen proteins. Uh, it tends to be the collagen proteins that tend to um, to ferment uh, further on the further down the road. Um, but uh, there have been some in, in vivo or in vitro studies rather of H. pylori and fructose, and uh, they they tend to thrive well on fructose. Also, you know they have um, they can convert fructose to glucose readily and and use that as well. Um, but the the in the in vivo or the real life implications of that have not been studied. So does that mean if you have an H. pylori infection, simply don't eat corn, you know, uh, corn syrup, which is actually only about 50% fructose, um, or well, like a, the agave, like that. What is that? Like the cactus? agave nectar, which is pretty much mostly fructose, isn't yeah. it? Like 70, 80% fructose. Yeah, 70, 80%, way more than than high fructose corn syrup. You know, the high fructose corn syrup gets the bad rap, but and the agave stuff is supposed to be better for you than honey, but Anyway, yeah, um, they're like candies and stuff that use a lot of fructose. Um, I don't, I don't think fruit would probably be a problem because it's so fibrous, you know. And it, but what about the other thing that I was thinking about is uh, gastric empty, gastric emptying, and the effects that some substrates have on gastric gastric emptying. Like there's some, uh, there are some proteins and carbohydrates that tend to prevent gastric emptying from happening. Like a lot of, uh, uh, you know, like, uh, some of these like sports drinks and protein shakes and all that stuff. Um, it, it slows down gastric emptying. Uh, and so like they, you know, you'll take a protein shake or something, you know, and, and not all protein shakes, but, um, like a lot of these, uh, branch chain amino acids, uh, tend to, uh, be an irritant and, uh, you know, BCAA powders or capsules or however you, know, you take them, uh, they tend to slow down the gastric emptying and, and kind of irritate the stomach. And so it slows everything down. And I think that might be something that you'd want to look at too, is to try to speed up gastric emptying and instead of slowing it down and just being very conscious of, um, you know, meal size and, trying to keep uh, things flowing through your stomach easily. Um, I, th that, I think that would probably be wise. But yeah, I've heard that uh, H. pylori can mess with leptin and ghrelin and modulate uh, hunger, uh, either increase it or decrease it depending on what it needs for survival uh, in the human body. Um, which is very interesting. You know, may, may also influence cravings uh, for sugar, glucose, and stuff like that. Um, so you know, it would seem that you know, Jason is correct in that that it might be able to you know influence some of our hormonal production, uh, you know, to, to to eat us to get us to eat, um, so that it could proliferate more, replicate more. Yeah, and sort of the types of food that we eat, uh, you know, the cravings that we get, I think would. Um, well, it's able, to, it's able to cause hypoglycemia. So, you know, generally if someone has low blood sugar, blood glucose, should I say, they tend to have, you know, different symptoms. And one of those seems to be hunger, uh, which would make them, you know, gravitate more towards uh, foods that are higher in sugar. Jason, I guess, would probably agree with me on that. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, it's, I mean, I think it would be, you know, the, if, if, if there was any other sort of illness that someone was having and we tried to treat it with a medication or supplement alone, it's sort of foolish, you know, say like a lifestyle change is what's important or else you're going to get sick again 
or you're going to uh, not fight it as readily. And you know the reason why you tend to have uh, dysbiosis and you know opportunistic uh, opportunistic bacterial infections is because of you know poor lifestyle and, and diet choices. And so that needs to be the first thing that you change. But it's very hard to since there's not a lot of data out there, it's very hard to make recommendations except Correct. through common sense, which is like, well, they're in the upper gut, so try not to keep food in the upper gut more than it needs to be. Maybe you shouldn't be counting the Snickers. <laughs> yeah, maybe uh, maybe try to avoid foodstuffs that break down very quickly, um, but uh, it's, it's just all theoretical. And real quick, Jason, I want to go uh, uh, talk about myself for a minute. Um, people know that I've suffered from silent reflux for years. And I've tested H. pylori many times, and it's always come back negative. And Jason himself has always told me that he believed that that's what I was suffering from. Um, and I believe that to be true. I believe that I had an H. pylori co-infection with uh, varicella cirrhosis that caused a chicken box. Uh, and that was a reason why I could never quite get over my silent reflux no matter what I did. Um, but I will say this, um, here recently I've done significant changes as far as uh, vagal manipulation through um, meditation and uh, through uh, getting sunlight to increase endogenous vitamin D and working on melatonin production and nice bar circadian rhythm. A lot of stuff that Jack Cruz talks about, you know, his basic tenets, which I agree with. Um, you know, not so much the, a lot of the science behind it, uh, you know, but the basic tenets itself is correct. And I will say for the first time in seven years, I'm really getting somewhere where, you know, my salary reflux wasn't a major hassle in my life the past couple of years. It was still rare. It's ugly head every so often. Um, but now I've done that. It would seem to me that, you know, if it was H. pylori, uh, getting UVB, uh, it regulates DAV regulates TH1 dominance um, and regulates the immune system to uh, increases nitrous oxide so that it can recognize the H. pylori again and reduce opportunistic overgrowth of it. Um, so anybody with an upper gut infection, especially H. pylori, it's paramount to work on your circadian rhythm as well as to get sunlight to produce endogenous vitamin D and, and endogenous uh, nitrous oxide production um, in the, and to reduce TH1 dominance that H. pylori causes in the immune system and it would to reduce inflammation um, so that you can overcome um, the, 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 the overgrowth itself. I do believe that diet it plays a big role in it um, and supplements and play a big role too in trying to reduce overgrowth and correcting nutritional balances. But I do believe for most people, because I've seen it in my own life, that proper circadian rhythm and proper endogenous vitamin D production and proper sunlight exposure is one of the biggest keys to overcoming um, an, an H. pylori upper gut um, overgrowth. So I just wanted to put it out, put that out there. Yeah, the getting your doctor's support on this uh, could be difficult, particularly if you know, you're getting tests that are coming back negative and your test, test comes back negative, doctor says, you don't have it. And really H. pylori is not life threatening and it's not, it's like an annoyance that can cause a lot of problems, but it's probably not going to kill you. Well, it won't kill you quickly, but it can make your life horrible and eventually kill you from a heart attack down the line. Yeah, I guess that's true, but they're not, but the medical community doesn't see it that way. Like oh, no. you die from a heart attack, they're gonna say it's because you know. You're... <laughs> or if you died from multiple sclerosis, oh, you know, it's just an autoimmune condition. It, it isn't possibly H. pylori, you know, but whatever. Well, here's what I thought might be uh, a way to kind of game the test, okay? And if you've got H. pylori, here's just a theory that I have. If you have H. pylori, this might be a way to gain the test. So what you do is, um, you know, you just get a, uh, you request a mouth swab. Like that's the, 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 the test you choose. And you get a mixture of just regular sucrose, all right, table sugar. And, you know, just uh, make a pretty heavy mixture of sugar water, you know, kind of like a hummingbird 
feed type of thing without the red dye. <laughs> Mix it up, swish it around in your mouth. You can spit it out if you want to. Um, you probably should spit it out. And it, there's really no reason to drink that much sugar before um, you know a doctor's appointment when you're just going to be sedentary. And then uh, you should start to, if you have if you have H. pylori, particularly if it's in the mouth or if it's in any quantity, you should start getting, uh, your teeth should start feeling like grungy and stuff. You'll feel that uh, the plaque starting to build up and just, you know, have them swab around that area. And if you got H. pylori in your oral cavity, it should come up positive. And that's, that's just, uh, that'll be my, my thing. Um, you know, if you think you have H. pylori and tests are coming back negative try that see see how it goes uh, if, it, if it works for you you know leave a message in the comment section I'd like to know if, yeah uh, I'm curious to see success with that I'm curious to see that too it might be successful I mean the oral cavity it, it once you are inoculated with it it does appear that it should remain there um, you know and stuff like that so you know it, it's a good test it's just like using uh, baking soda or PPIs to draw out the bacteria before you do some sort of biopsy or some sort of stool antigen test. Um, you know, I've heard though that too as well to try to draw it out to see if you can get a positive result, um, you know, by reduction of stomach acid. I've seen some people talk about doing that as well. Um, I just wish that there was better testing for it. I've seen a pretty decent stool antigen test from DRG Labs that also measures virulence factors and so forth and so on. It looks nice. It's not perfect. Um, excuse me, I had had a client who, who, who did take it who, um, it, you know, would appear that they, they, they were suffering from an H. pylori um, after, you know, doing a, taking mastigum as incarnacine to help with their geographic tongue. Um, you know, so I mean, my guess for most people is if you got the symptoms, if you got severe ulcers and you're not testing positive, then what hurt is it going to be for you trying to increase your vitamin D levels and you changing up your diet and maybe taking a few supplements like zinc carnosine or mastic gum or delimonene, you know, with your doctor knowing to see if you don't get any better. That's all. At yeah. most, you at most you wasted two or three weeks out of your life. And and some money for the supplements. Uh, Manuka honey has yeah. uh, been known to help as well. Um, but yeah, I mean, it's just at Fix Your Gut. We encourage you to work with your your medical your licensed medical practitioner. Um, just you know to keep it all legal and everything. Um, and we would like for we would like to. You know, we'd just like the people, uh, people to be able to show what their doctors, you know, to show their doctors, okay, this is, this is positive where, because the doctor, but doctors are busy, they don't have time to be running 17, 18 uh, tests for the same thing that keeps coming back negative. Yeah. You know, they're just, they're, they're going to get aggressive. Now, you know, insurance they're... companies don't want to pay for it and stuff like that. It's just, we have, yeah. I mean, I, I agree with Jason, you definitely should work with your doctor. I'm not saying, you know. Definitely, let just like I said, make sure your doctor knows about you. Yeah, this. I mean, the doctor, your doctor, like after the first time it comes back negative, they're going to be really confident when they come back and tell you you don't have this because you know they they want to be you know they they that's what they're taught they they they're taught to be authoritative so that they can get more compliance from their patients and they say leave this alone, you know you you don't have this go bark up another tree, you know, just pull yourself up by your bootstraps and move on. You know, take these PPIs, you'll be fine <laughs> or whatever, you know. Uh, but if, yeah. you can, if you could game the test a little bit and get a positive result, then, you know, that that might help you work with your doctor even more. And um, it's, it's, always, it's always good to tell your doctor what you're doing. Always. Um, and, always. And say, like, this is, what I, this is what I think I have. This is what I'm doing. I'm taking these supplements. I'm getting exposure to sunlight because, you know, I want to raise my nitrous oxide levels. You know, it, it's, it's important to communicate that to your doctor if your doctor's saying, don't do that, don't do whatever. Um, and, you know, you just can't reach an agreement. Then it's time to find a new doctor. There's probably not just one doctor in the the town you live in, uh, you could probably find another one who's more on board with 
um, what you're doing and wants to support you. And you know, if if you keep going to doctors and they keep telling you the same thing, well, then I don't know. Uh, move. <laughs> I <don't know> <laughs> yeah, I agree. You know, always make sure that you tell your doctor to never hide anything from your doctor or your medical professional. And I've never wanted anybody to do that. Even with people I've coached, I've always wanted them to completely, be completely honest with whoever they're working with. Um, you know, and you know, it's important. You know, and and, and Jason's right. If they, if the worst worst they they could do is call you stupid and insult you to make you go find somebody else, or tell you to get out of my practice, I don't want to deal with you. Well. If, that's the case of how they feel, then they don't deserve to be your doctor in the first place. Yeah. And, and legitimately though, not everybody's going to work well with everybody else. Sure. I mean, there's going to be, you know, there's going to be coaching clients that we have that we just don't gel with and say like, listen, I don't think I'm the right coach for you. Um, I think you need to, I think you'd be more, spe I think you'd be, get more benefit from working for this person or that person or something. The same thing with doctors, except uh, they usually don't have that conversation because they don't have very long conversation with their patients generally. So it's just, they read your chart and they're like, this is what's happening. You know, it's very, you know, one-sided uh, and then, and then you move on. But I'm just trying to come up with a way to, to help gain the system so you get the support that you need from your medical provider. Yes, because H. pylori, if you do test positive for it, or you do have it even if you don't test positive, it can cause severe strife in your life. Um, it did to me, and it's done to quite a few people I've coached, where it's caused a lot of problems that you wouldn't think one bacteria that infects your stomach could cause, but it can. Yeah. Well, ladies and gentlemen, or according to our demographics, lady and gentlemen, uh, we're gonna call it a night. So thanks for watching. Um, if you have questions, uh, leave them in the comment section or uh, reach out to us on Fix Your Gut for some coaching. Good night, everybody. Take care.